Hello and welcome to our webinar, uh, IO Reduction Software Improves SQL Performance. Uh, my name is David Lloyd, I'm an account executive at Grey Matter. Uh, for those of you not familiar with Grey Matter, we're, we're based in, in the sunny southwest uh, in a town called Ashburton uh, and we've been trading since 1983. Uh, we provide software, services, mobile and licensing advice for over 400 publisher partners covering security, design and media, cloud, DevOps, network tools and more to all company sizes and verticals. We're proud to be a conducive partner. Uh, we've been working with them for many years as their products enable us to give real-world performance gains to customers and extend the life of their hardware investments. We're hosting this webinar as we want to help you cut costs and improve your SQL performance by using DiskKeeper and Velocity from Conducive. As a thank you for attending, Conducive will provide you with a fully featured copy of DiskKeeper Pro so that after the webinar you can start to experience the tool for yourself and get a feel for how it works. If you have any questions during the webinar, please use the questions feature and we will answer them at the end and, or take them offline if they can't be covered in the time we have. Uh, now I'll hand over to Spencer Allingham, uh, who's the technical director at Conducive in the UK, who will show you how their IO reduction software can help your business. That's great. Thank you, David. Um, so in, in, in terms of who I am inside Conducive, I'm actually the, the technical director. Um, and as, as David said, if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the Q&A box. And maybe we'll try and answer a few as we're going through as well, if they're, if they're pertinent. So it may be that some of you are sitting out there and thinking, well, I've actually not heard of Conducive. Who are they? Some of you may have heard of our old uh, DiskKeeper product that's been in the marketplace for quite some time. Um, and you might remember it as being more of a defrag solution, um, which is very much its focus in the past. Now, we rebranded from DiskKeeper Corporation to Conducive about five years ago now. Um, really because our technology has moved on significantly from the old defrag days. The, the, the software that we're talking about today really has very little to do with old school defragmentation. And you'll see that as we go through. Um, now, about five years ago when we rebranded, because of what we were doing for the uh, virtualization space and for performance, Gartner gave us the call vendor badge, which was very, very nice. Um, but we've had deep engineering relationships with both Microsoft and VMware for, for quite some time. In fact, Microsoft, it goes back to the mid-90s when they first, first bought out Windows NT4. But what we're really proud about just recently is that if you look at the, the bottom right-hand side of the, of the slide there, you'll see Microsoft just recently uh, awarded us the Microsoft SQL Server IO Reliability Certification. Now, what this basically means is that Microsoft have certified our Velocity software for use with SQL Server. Um, they used SQL Server 2016 um, running in Azure, um, and they used a, a package called HammerDB to generate the type of workload that you would see if you are running a, an online transaction processing type workload. Um, and what was very cool, aside from getting just the certification, was that we proved with our software on that test that we were able to uh, provide 28% more SQL transactions per day uh, in the same amount of time. Um, and actually, those are pretty conservative figures because the amount of RAM that was being used for the caching um, was fairly limited. Um, I would expect if you were to allocate a bit more RAM, you would see a, a greater number of SQL transactions possible um, per minute, per hour, per day, and so on. But we were very pleased to get that certification. Um, and uh, I actually have some write-ups on that. So if anybody wants a, a little bedtime reading around the certification and the type of workloads that we were doing, feel free to let us know. Um, if you uh, put a, a message in the chat box, uh, we can uh, send it out to you after this call. So uh, let me see. Uh, Leanne, can I have the, the next slide? Or have I got the control here? I think you uh, have yes, control. I do. I do. Perfect. So something that's that's been quite interesting uh, to a lot of SQL DB admins is 
part of this survey that we conducted um, earlier on the year, uh, and we produced a nice big word cloud around it um, as well, which was you might have seen on LinkedIn. But this particular question I felt was pertinent to share with you guys. It was this, regarding your IO intensive applications running on SQL Server, do you experience staff or customer complaints due to sluggish performance? Now, happily and thankfully, most of the respondents said no, everything was fine. And that's what you should be getting with SQL Server. But 27% of those responded said yes, we actually do get complaints about performance related to SQL Server. Um, now, this is something that we can certainly help with. Um, when you have a SQL Server, it's part of your IT estate. The slowest part of that IT estate is always going to be the storage at the back end. You know, even if you've got a, an all flash array or a tray of SSDs sitting in the tier one of your SAN, if you compare the speed at which operations or transactions can occur down at that storage layer, it will always be slower than the speed at which operations can happen at a processor layer or in server-side DRAM. You know, uh, server memory is roughly 10 times faster than SSD storage. So oftentimes we find that the slow or sluggish performance is because that storage is getting choked up. Um, and that's absolutely where we can help. So let's take a, a little bit of a look about the problem itself and, and what we can do to, to fix it. So this is a, a rough representation of a, a virtualized environment. Some of you may be using SQL on physical servers, perhaps with direct attached disks or, or a SAN at the back end. This same thing happens in terms of this layer here. But this is what it looks like when everything is working well and is working efficiently. You have your host hypervisor, your physical server sitting here in the middle, and it's hosting a number of virtual machines. And they could all be running SQL Server, but you would typically have some SQL, maybe some file and print, maybe some application servers, maybe you've got a CRM or um, a business information system like IBM Cognos or SAP. And these are all generating storage IO traffic, which is being funneled down through the physical host and then onto the storage at the back end. Now, the reason why I say this is what it looks like when everything is working well, is that you have the least number of storage IO packets carrying the most amount of data. Now, as these are being funneled down through the hypervisor, they're arriving down here at the storage on the back end in nice large chunks at a time. And that means the storage controller has the opportunity to create nice large unbroken stripes across its media using the least number of storage level operations. So that's a very efficient way of getting data between server and storage and back again if it needs to be read in. But if you're running Windows in these virtual machines or on physical Windows servers, this is not typically what you're going to get. What you're going to get actually is going to look something like this. So what's happening here? As your NTFS file systems mature over time, these NTFS volumes that you've got connected to the VMs, what happens is your uh, SQL databases or, or users, they're, they're generating new files, they're extending existing files, they're deleting files, they're moving files around on, on the NTFS volume. What will naturally happen is that the free space on those volumes will become more and more split up over time into smaller and smaller free space extents. Now, in the case of SQL Server, it is generally considered best practice when you're creating a new volume to host those SQL database files to format it with a 64K cluster size, which is the largest cluster size you can have on an NTFS volume. But not everybody does that. Some people just format it with all the, all the defaults, and that means a 4K cluster size. So you've got very small clusters, and that causes, well, in the old days, that would have caused a, a great deal of fragmentation. It still does. But what we're concerned about here are these split IOs, and the 
overhead and performance loss that these cause. So when your free space gets split up in this way, what's happening is the Windows write driver is being given a right to perform. It then goes to a part of Windows called the um, free space cache. And it says, hey, free space cache, where's my first available free space extent? I've got a right to perform. The free space cache then provides that address of that free space extent and the right driver will start writing its data and then it'll find, ah, I don't actually have enough room to complete this write. So what I'm going to have to do is split the IO, I'll send the data I've already written on down to the storage and then go back to the Windows free space cache, find my next available free space extent and I'll continue writing there. And it'll find again, I still don't have enough room, so I'm going to have to split the I.O. again, go back to the Windows free space cache again, find my next available free space extent, and basically repeat and repeat and repeat until it's written out that data and completed the write. So in the real world, what that means is that a gigabyte of storage I.O. traffic that should take maybe 2,000 or 3,000 I.O.s to complete is now taking 30,000 or 40,000 IOs to complete. And keep in mind that each IO packet that has to be generated will take a measurable amount of time and resource to process. So this now starts to become a much less efficient way of getting data between server and storage. We call this split IO situation the Windows IO tax, as in a tax on your performance because you're running Windows. And in a virtualized environment, this performance penalty gets amplified by something called the I.O. Blender effect. And what's happening here is you have these small fractured I.O. packets coming out of all of the VMs. They're all going into the hypervisor, which acts a bit like a blender. And it mixes these I.O. streams together from the disparate virtual machines at the top. So that what comes out now between the physical host and the storage is now a chaotic mess of small, fractured, and very randomized I.O. streams. So this randomization amplifies the performance penalty. What it means is by the time the I.O. packets arrive down here at the storage controller, they're only arriving in very small chunks at a time. The storage controller doesn't understand the relationship between the various packets because it's too far abstracted away from where the I.O. was generated in the first place. So as far as it's concerned, it's only got these tiny I.O. packets to deal with. It can only create very small stripes across its media, and that means a lot more storage level operations are required to process that same amount of data. So what are we doing to fix this problem? We have a software-only solution. Um, we have today's disk keeper, not the old defrag tool that you remember from years ago, but today's disk keeper and velocity for virtual environments. Actually, I'll let you into a little secret. They're, they're pretty much the same product. The distinction between the two is more of a marketing one. They both share the same uh, code base. They, they share the same feature set. They both do the same job. But we've kept the disk keeper brand because people remember it from years ago as, as being a solution for physical machines. Um, and of course, you can run Disk Keeper in a virtual machine if you want to, um, but typically it works out more economic to use velocity in a, in a virtual environment. Um, so what we do is install the software, it's a software-only solution, into the virtual machines or into the uh, physical Windows servers, if, if that's what you're running. And this adds an extra layer of intelligence to the Windows write driver. So that instead of having to keep go back to that Windows free space cache to find yet another free space extent that's too small, it says, hey, free space cache, start writing here on the NTFS volume where there is a large enough area of free space to put that data into without having to split it up or split it up the least. And of course, our software can help provide you those nice large areas of free space to make it easier to write into as well. So that has an effect on what we're seeing here in that you are significantly reducing the number of storage I.O. packets that are required, not only when you're writing, but also if you subsequently need to read that data back in. It's a bit like um, 
it's a bit like if you've ever traveled around the M25 around London at rush hour, um, it's, it's, it gets very choked up. It, it's um, a, a big traffic jam, basically. Everybody's sitting in their car bumper to bumper. No one's moving more than about five or 10 miles an hour. And it's a very frustrating situation because it gets congested. So now imagine that each car is an IO packet and each person inside each car is your data. What we're effectively doing with our software is taking all of the people out of all of the cars and we're putting them into coaches and buses and then taking all the cars off of the motorway and getting rid of all of that congestion so that the people or your data can now flow to where it needs to get to in a much more efficient manner. So I hope that's a good analogy. I hope that makes sense. Now, what we then do to reduce the IO traffic even further is use some of the idle available memory that's sitting in these machines, in these Windows operating systems, and we set up a RAM cache where we can satisfy a good percentage of the read IO traffic from RAM instead of the underlying storage. Now, this has two main benefits. First, as I mentioned, it further reduces the amount of workload that this slower storage on the back end has to deal with and gives everything between server and storage less work to do. And it means that that traffic that gets satisfied from the RAM cache is being satisfied at the speed of server-side DRAM, which, as I said before, is roughly 10 times faster than SSD. It's significantly faster than things like uh, SAS drives that you might have in your SAN as well. So this has a very beneficial effect. If we can um, have your storage hungry applications like SQL um, not have to wait so much on the storage before being able to get on with their next operation, that quite simply equates into being able to do more SQL transactions in the same amount of time. What we haven't had to do is change any of your hardware infrastructure. It's a software only solution. We take your existing IT environment and make it run as it properly should, rather than have it waste 20, 30, 40% of its compute to all of this excess unnecessary traffic that frankly doesn't really need to happen. So uh, a brief recap, we are a software only solution. We provide these large, clean, contiguous writes for more data payload. So you get fewer but larger IO packets. Now you can, if, if some of you are familiar with networking, there is a, a networking term called jumbo frames where it's a similar sort of concept. You, you have fewer IO packets traversing the network, but each one that is there is carrying more data. And it's a much more efficient way of getting data from point A to point B. We're doing the same thing here, but we're sending jumbo packets down to the storage that can be dealt with in a much more efficient manner. We've got the RAM caching, um, caching hot reads from server side DRAM rather than having them all have to go out to the storage on the back end. Um, and we have a, a benefit, uh, a benefit, a benefits dashboard that actually shows how much storage IO time that's, that's being saved. Uh, and I'll show that to you in a sec. And I'm also very pleased about the last point. We, we do actually guarantee to solve the toughest performance problems on things like your SQL servers, or we'll give you your money back. Now, there isn't, there are not many software companies that are bold enough to make that sort of statement, but hopefully it'll give you some idea as to how confident we are this, this stuff works. Uh, we've, we've proven it time and time again with, with customers of all different types and, and sizes. Um, we're not saying that you have to buy the software up front. Absolutely not. And I'll, I'll show you later on. We've got trialware available so that you can test it. And I know that we had agreed to give a copy of Diskeeper Professional to everybody here. But I'm actually going to override that. As the, uh, as the technical director for Amir, I'm going to say, why don't we give you one server copy that you can put on your worst performing or, or most difficult to support SQL Server? Um, and see what difference it makes and get a chance to, to play with the software. 
the best way of running a, a proof of concept is to try and get the software onto as many machines as possible. And for that, you, you probably would want to use the 30-day trial way because then you can offload as much of that storage as you possibly can. And that's really going to give you best results. So I know Greg's listening in on this, so I'm going to get him to make a note of that. Greg, I have promised everybody a, a full server copy so that they can have a play with that rather than just the, the DK Pro. So we've spoken a little bit already about the right I.O. reduction and what we do. We, we add that extra layer of intelligence to the Windows right driver so that it can quite simply make better choices about how it creates that right I.O. traffic, which then not only makes it efficient when writing, but also subsequently reading. What's important to note is that we are not bypassing the Windows operating system in any way. It is still the standard Windows right driver creating a standard NTFS I.O. packet and sending it on down to the storage. So as long as your storage at the back end is compatible with Windows running above it, uh, we're completely agnostic of the, of, the, of the storage that you're using. We're also completely agnostic of the hypervisor if you're in a virtualized environment. Um, and because of this, we are fully ACID compliant. Um, and I know that that is something that, that quite a lot of SQL DB admins are concerned about. So we, we are compliant with uh, ACID and you know, it is definitely beneficial to use this infrastructure in a, in a more sensible way. So that's the right IO reduction. The RAM caching, um, now this is an interesting one when being used on SQL servers because SQL tends to be not so much memory hungry as, as memory addicted. <laughs> so, um, if you don't, if you haven't already capped the amount of memory that SQL can take for itself, what's probably happening on your SQL server is you have your operating system loading and taking a chunk of memory and, and using that. Then you've got SQL probably chewing through most of what's left and leaving only a tiny bit free or idle. And what it's using that memory for is for its own form of caching called buffering. Um, and what it's trying to do is, is basically load as much of its database or databases into memory as it can. But honestly, it doesn't do a terribly good job of making sure it's using that RAM to cache the right data at the right time. So I'm not saying by any means turn off the caching in SQL. Absolutely not. The benefits that you get from our caching are in addition to what you're already getting from SQL and what you're already getting from the Windows operating system. So we're not saying turn off caches anywhere else. We're saying we can do an even better job and leave those caches on. Now, if you do have a situation where you haven't capped SQL, what I would recommend is you cap it as it is at the moment and then maybe add a little bit of additional memory so that we have enough memory resource to play with. Um, if you don't cap SQL and you just add more memory, well, when you bring the machine back online, SQL will rub its hands together and say, hey, thank you very much. I'm taking that memory as well. <laughs> so you, you would have to uh, cap SQL if you haven't done already. Um, if you can leave four gigabytes of available physical memory, so that's RAM that's not being used by anything else, that would typically give our software roughly a two gigabyte cache size. And in real terms, that's usually enough to offload somewhere between 30 and 50% of all of the read traffic away from that underlying storage. No. And that's got to be beneficial from a performance point of view when you consider the speed of operations at the RAM layer rather than that storage layer. So what are some of our customers typically look like? These are all representative of full case studies that we have on, on our website, and we can share these with you as well. Again, if you want some more uh, light bedtime reading, <laughs> it's guaranteed to put you to sleep. <laughs> um, I won't bore you by reading out all of these, but I'll, I'll pick out a couple that I think are probably relevant and maybe interesting. The first one is, is this company down here, Bell Mobility. They're a, a telecoms company in Canada, and we reduced the IO traffic going out to their SAN storage by 61%. And that gave them SQL queries that were three times faster. No additional hardware required. They just installed the software. That was it. Now, when you install the software, it has to load these storage filter drivers. That can only be done at boot time. So you will have to 
reboot the machines before the software can become active, but you're not forced to reboot immediately after the install. So you, know, you could install this afternoon, for example, and then maybe reboot at the weekend or the next time you, you do your patch Tuesday. Um, ASL marketing here in the middle. They, they were doing SQL batch imports that were taking 27 hours, which was way, way too long. Um, they put our software in, we dropped that to just 12 hours, a significant reduction. Uh, Creative Office Pavilion up here, uh, response times for SQL, their CRM, and their mail server, now 90% faster than they were. The common thread between all of these is that they all saw at least a doubling in performance using the infrastructure they had already purchased, that CapEx investment they'd already made, they weren't getting all of the compute they paid for. And now this software then allowed them to do that. So some very recent uh, customer examples, um, Alvernia University. They had 3,000 students accessing an LMS application and it was timing out uh, because the IO traffic was, was getting too laggy. Um, they didn't have the budget for an all-flash array, so they turned to our software and we doubled the performance of the SQL database and all of the timeouts stopped. Now, why would they go for velocity rather than hardware? Well, velocity is significantly more cost-effective than what you would have to spend on hardware to achieve the same performance gains. Now, I know as an IT guy, as, a, as an engineer or, or chief nerd for, for the EMEA region, that we've been taught for decades, whenever there's any kind of performance problem with the environment, the go-to solution is to buy more hardware, throw more spindles into the sand and spread the load of that IO traffic over a greater number of moving parts or throw in a, a tray of flash or SSD, uh, maybe get some faster LBA cards, throw more hardware at the solution. And what you're doing is masking the problem. You're not actually fixing it. You're, you're having this situation where you're having to overbuy and overpurchase in order to overprovision the hardware for all of this excess unnecessary storage traffic that frankly does not need to happen. So take your existing environment and keep it running for longer. Sweat those assets for a greater amount of time. And when you do finally need to buy more hardware, do you need to over-provision it quite so much? Maybe not. Um, another one here, Admiral Metals. Uh, the users would experience lag under peak load on their in-house written app uh, when they were querying the metal prices, and it was really quite laggy for them. We doubled their SQL performance, and all of that lag just simply disappeared. Um, and this is this last one that I'll pick out here, Agrium. This is going back to that point I just made. Their SQL databases began to slow, and they were only three years into their SAN lifecycle, which they were, had provisioned five years out of, but it was already starting to get slow and, and be problematic we doubled the performance of SQL running on, on that infrastructure. And now they, not only can they keep that running for the full five years, they're now talk they're gonna keep it running for longer as well. Um, and it allows them to budget better for the next hardware purchase. But the important thing for you as SQL guys is that we could get more performance out of their SQL servers using the infrastructure that they already own. So, oh, I promised to, to show you the, the dashboard and what that looks like. This is um, what I would say you would get as typical results in terms of IO eliminated from the storage at the back end on a typical Windows server running SQL where you can leave four gig of available physical memory. So here, in, in the last two weeks in this example, we were able to eliminate over 12 million IOs from having to go out and hit the back end storage. Half of all of the read IOs didn't have to go out to the backend storage, and about 30% of the writes. And I see this time and time again with customers of all types. It's, it's usually around this sort of mark. And in those two weeks, this uh, IO traffic that was eliminated saved them over five and a half hours of storage IO time. Now, the storage IO time value is generated based on the number of IOs that we eliminated from having to go out to the storage, multiplied by the average IO response time at the time those IOs were generated. 
and this was from just one server. Imagine if you had all of your SQL servers included in here, what the numbers would be. So there are a couple of, of next step options. Um, as I say, everyone is going to get uh, an NFR copy of the software, and I will make sure that it's uh, uh, a server copy for you to run on your worst performing SQL server so that you can, you can try it. Uh, and, and have a good play with the software, prove that it works. Um, now, the best way though to really do a proper proof of concept, as I mentioned before, is to get it onto as many machines as you possibly can that are sharing the same physical host hypervisor or sharing the same shared storage like a SAN or a NAS. Um, that's really where you're gonna see the most bang for buck. The more of that workload you can offload from that storage, which is the slowest part of the IT infrastructure, the better everything is going to run. So you could put it on just one machine and it will benefit that machine, but you might still have a number of other machines that are still sending all of this excess unnecessary traffic on down to the storage at the back end. But if you put the software onto all of the machines, then whatever machine is generating the traffic at any given time, you are reducing it and optimizing it the most. And now your SAN or whatever storage you have sitting on the back end is now quite simply doing the least amount of work. What you've done is reduce IOQ depths, you've reduced latency, and you've made plenty of storage IO bandwidth available to the environment. And that's one of the key things of the software is if you can reduce the IO, you're handing back IO or IOPS headroom back to the environment, that's number of IOs per second, that you can now use for additional workloads. So we've already seen for a lot of our customers that meant their storage hungry applications like SQL can now do more work in the same amount of time because they're not waiting so much on the storage before getting on with their next transaction. But what it can also mean is that now you've got that IO headroom to host more machines, more instances of SQL, more users over that same hardware infrastructure without having to, heaven forbid, rip and replace the SAM with something bigger and more expensive or upgrade it. So I hope that makes sense. I think, have we, uh, David, have we got any questions come through? I'm just going to check that, Spencer. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, yeah, let's have a quick look, see if we have any questions right now. Okay. Um, so how can you separate IO bottlenecks from slowdowns caused by poor software or query design? <laughs> That's a very good question, and it was definitely a DB admin that wrote that. <laughs> Absolutely. So the, the short answer is we can't. Um, if your SQL queries have been uh, perhaps, I kind of put it diplomatically, not written in the most efficient manner, um, and I know, I know from speaking with DB admins that that's uh, a common complaint. We we we're not going to interfere with SQL directly. Um, if you've got uh, a, a badly performing SQL query or a, a, a SQL batch job that's running that's not been written particularly efficiently and is generating a lot of storage I/O traffic, we're not going to modify that batch job or, or interfere with SQL. What we are going to do is have that batch job or query run better and faster by making the supporting infrastructure on the back end more efficient for you. Okay, if there are any more questions, uh, feel free to use the, the questions feature. I think that, that kind of wraps it up now. Um, so thank you very much, Spencer. Um, and don't forget, uh, you'll be receiving your, your free full server copy of DiskKeeper Pro after the event from Conducive. Thanks everyone for attending and, to, and, and for Spencer for talking us through the solution. Um, if anybody has any further questions uh, that, that sort of occur to them afterwards, or you'd like a one-to-one -one demo of the product, or you want to engage with us in any other way, if you want pricing or anything else, uh, just get in contact with me uh, at Grey Matter. Uh, you can call me 01364 655124 or email me davidl at graymatter.com. 
Uh, we'll be sending out a short survey after the webinar to get your thoughts and ideas for future webinars uh, and your feedback would be greatly appreciated. Thank you.